climate change. What are the first things you envision when you think about these two words? Hurricanes? Droughts? Melting ice? For years, we've heard so much about changes in climate and have reported on extreme weather, but something has been missing. We wanted to see the faces of the people who are directly impacted by these changes on a daily basis, even while the eyes of the world look elsewhere. So we decided to go to the edge of the world, to the last frontier, Alaska. We heard that even further north, an island city by the name of Shishmaref was on its last sticks as coastal erosion, melting sea ice, and extreme storms were closer and closer to wiping the island off the map. We wanted to meet the few families living in Shishmaref to see how their changing climate was affecting their way of life and spend days with them to try to understand how they live 40 degrees below zero in the winter and with the risk of seeing their homes fall into the sea every summer. All the way north of the Seward Peninsula, Sarachev Island, home to the community of Shishmaref, is shrinking. Year in and year out, people here bear witness to the forces of Mother Nature. Long-time residents know its history all too well. I was born and raised here. My father started this business that I'm running in uh, 1960. I took over management about 1990. In 1974, there was a two or three-day storm that this island uh, almost didn't survive. We came that close to being underwater. It scared a lot of people. It scared some people so bad they moved out. I'm the mayor here in Shishmaref. Uh, my name is Howard P. Wilwana Sr. Mayor Howard recalled a more recent storm in 2005. During that initial storm, there was um, like three homes that were that we lost to the Mother Nature. But I'm seeing like um, almost 20 homes were moved. But the erosion was so bad that we, they had to be moved. Every year, these storms chip away at Shishmaref's coastline, which continues to recede at an alarming rate. This island is so much smaller now than it was back then. And, and I'm not sure if this island could take an assault like the one in 74. I think we just take it uh, year by year, you know, and take on what uh, Mother Nature uh, throws at us. But why has she thrown so much of her force at this island community? Back in Fairbanks, scientist Tor Jorgensen offered some insight. I'm a landscape ecologist. I have a company, Alaska Ecoscience, where we study the effects of climate change on Alaska's landscapes. Shishmaref is built on a barrier island system. And so it's uh, highly dynamic in terms of coastal currents moving. And we see it from sea ice retreat where sea ice is declining about 3% a year and opening up vast stretches of the Arctic Ocean. So the wind blowing over that open ocean over hundreds to thousands of miles um, can create waves now that are much larger than they used to be. So for Shishmaref, Corps of Engineers has done detailed analyses of erosion rates and what kind of methods to be able to use to even protect a, a barrier island system. 
So we went and looked at it, and we found evidence that a lot of the bluff was being supported by ice underneath of it, and thawing of the bluff was one of the major issues that was causing problems. The U.S. Army Corps of Engineers constructed a large rock revetment on the shore to offer protection the island no longer gets naturally from sea ice. If you hadn't put in those revetments, you would have erosion that would go right now straight down the road between the school and the school housing. All of these revetments have worked. Some have eroded a little bit more than others, but they have all done the job of giving Shishmaref some time. Again, making a caribou shoe. Caribou. Families are at the heart of the Inupiaq culture, and Clara and Shelton Kakiak have grown theirs right here by the Chukchi Sea. We got how many grandkids now? Eleven boys, two granddaughters, and one great. <laughs> Chile, one great. Their youngest child was Norman Charlie, an athletic and energetic hunter. I had the youngest one, that boy. We always call him boy. That was the youngest one. He graduated from here, and then he go hunting. He always go hunting whenever he got chance. I think he moved down to Fairbanks in 2003 with his wife. And then after that, he, he take time off from his job. And, come up and do the hunting for us. He liked to hunt, that's why. He liked to come back here and go hunt, and then go back to Fairbanks after he hunt. He just loved to hunt. That's how it happened. I tried to wait until about four or five, five o'clock in the morning and then and fell asleep, had little rest. And then about six o'clock in the morning, our, our phone rang. She answered. Mm -hmm. We didn't know till they told us early in the morning that he fell through the ice. His partner got nothing to get him. No rope, nothing, no sled, nothing, just his rifle. Just his, couldn't help him. That, that was really bad. Really bad for our family. Kakiaks are not alone in their struggle. The dangers of weaker ice buildup are something that many locals have become very familiar with. We've had people falling through the ice in the past few years. We, we, we had a fatality uh, a few years ago. When the ice used to be uh, four to six feet thick of all white ice. But now it, it breaks up so early, it doesn't freeze as uh, solid. It isn't like ice that was 50 years ago when I was a kid. Back then, uh, the hunters would be all on ice already right now with their dog teams. We'd be able to go out like 25, 30 miles out to harvest uh, for bearded seal. Hunting and fishing provide their main source of food, but these activities are becoming riskier and riskier to do. Things have changed so rapidly as far as ice that it, it become quite dangerous to be around the ice now. We are very careful. We learned that from, from the past. The Inupiaqs have an old custom here to name newborns in honor of a community member who has passed on. You mean about his namesake? Yeah, he's just quite a few here. 
when they make boy, they have to name him his name, you know. His namesakes are five and six year old now. That's a tradition, you know. Yeah. That was the tradition from centuries. Right now you live with your grandson. Yeah, he lived with us. We raised him too. We're so happy for him. She helped around in the house. Get wash water or ice, bring some ice. They help us on heavy lifting. Family, I think it's everything. <laughs> yeah. Shishmarev has to make some decisions. Will they relocate or will they stay where they're at and sort of what we call stand and defend? That's totally affected the community in the past. Just a word, relocation. Shishmarev received a revetment and the revetment was uh, designed to allow them to have some time which to keep their community safe while they went forward in relocation. The organizations that are not from here misunderstood that we'd be moving it when one or two years back then, and we're still here. awareness of the consequences of us failing to mitigate our greenhouse gas emissions. My name is Robin Brunin. I have been doing research since 2007 on the community relocations happening in Alaska. Relocation is always the last resort. The challenge is um, with sea level rise um, and with our technology, we don't know how long people will be able to be protected in place. And now government agencies are doing their best, but uh, it's taking an extraordinarily long time because there's no relocation institutional framework. No government agency has the mandate, right, to relocate them. You have this culture that is important and needs to be continued. It's important in that manner. Can I put a dollar on it? No. Can I put a face on it? Yes. It's the face of Shishmaref. Well, it's our culture. We're supposed to, uh, to protect this whole island so that our children, our grandchildren, and their children can also experience this lifestyle what we're living now. If relocating just one community is so complicated, what then is the fate of so many other coastal cities around the globe? My concern is not only for the communities in Alaska who are deeply connected to the places where they live, but for the millions of people all over the world who are going to be affected by the exact same issue and were completely unprepared. And by the time proper funding kicks in, and entities are set up to oversee relocations, places like this may just have to grin and bear. As you know now, we're still here, and the studies are still uh, ongoing. The last phase of the studies, well, the people who are doing the studies are coming here next week. We can't tell you what will happen to Shishmaref, but the Inupiaqs have shown us that even under the greatest challenges, They'll persevere, no matter what. I told them that I'm not going to leave from here, I'll be here. Even when they walk, talk about relocation on the village, I, I would tell them I'm not moving out of here. <laughs>